As an amateur, I had 150 fights. I won three national championships. I fought at Madison Square Gardens and won a silver medal in the Goodwill Games World Championship. As a professional, I'm 22 and 2. 14 wins coming by way of knockout. I'm the number five ranked fighter in the world. I'm a man on a mission. I may fight for a living, but my mission is to tell people about Jesus. I was in church all my life, but I was 24 years old before I made a commitment to live my life for Jesus. Early in high school, I started down a road that was full of sex, drugs, and alcohol abuse. And I saw later that that road led to destruction. Although the sin felt harmless, it allowed Satan to get a foothold in my life. I married my high school sweetheart at 18 years old, and only a year later we were divorced. My life and all my dreams had fallen apart. I learned that nothing in this world will give you happiness, and the man that wants never has enough. That's when I decided to turn my life to Jesus Christ, and I learned what real happiness was all about. With Christ in my life, I have hope, peace, and joy in any situation. He's restored my marriage, he's given me a great testimony in the sport of boxing. There's a plan Jesus Christ has for your life, just accept it. I'm not here to tell you that serving God is easy. It's always easy to get off track. But serving God sure beats the life I have before I knew it. All of my strength and courage to fight have come from Christ. That's why it's always first on my heart to give Him glory. Whether your stage is small or large, God can use you to spread His message. When it comes down to it, as a Christian, it's your job to spread the message of Jesus Christ. Boxing is the platform that God's given me to spread His message. But no matter what you do or who you are, if you're willing and obedient, God can use you as well. Why don't you make your mission His mission? Ebo! <laughs>
could pierce the hearts of everyone here and reveal yourself in a mighty way, God, that every man here would leave, set on a new path, a new path of influence and power in your name, Jesus. We pray, amen. You guys, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm not a motivational speaker. And this is not a self-help or self-preservation conference. It's not a sin management class. And this is something far greater than that. You know, I do believe, however, that living the way Jesus taught to live will improve your life. I believe it will do that. I don't believe, however, that living Jesus' way will give you the right, the car you want or the house you might want, or the promotion you might want. But I believe that living for Jesus will give you peace in any situation. It will give you power and authority on this earth. I believe that living the way Jesus taught to live is the best way to live. Loving your enemy, forgiveness, having grace, having mercy, giving to one another. I believe that's the best way to live. So that's why I follow Jesus Christ. Not because I'm a churchy guy, but because I just believe Jesus is the, the best way. I believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? You guys, this is not a motivational speech. This is a call to war. This is a call to battle. This is a call to fight the good fight. It's a fight between good and evil and a fight between flesh and spirit. Erwin McManus said it well in the book, The Barbarian Way. He said, when you're born again, you're not dropped into a cushy, comfy maternity ward or a, a pretty little nursery with bunny rabbits running around the walls and clouds painted on the ceiling. You're dropped right into a battlefield. When you're born again, you're dropped right into the front lines of battle. And you guys today are being put on the front line. When you leave here, Satan is going to attack you, I promise you. It will happen. Satan does, uh, tries to be involved in your life twice in your life. It's either before God does something big or right after he does something big. I feel that many of you today probably had a hard time getting up and coming. Something may have happened to, that could have kept you from being here. That's because Satan knew something powerful was going to happen, that a good seed was going to get planted in your life that would change you radically. And I believe as soon as you walk out of this building... Satan's going to try again. The enemy's going to try again to defeat what is happening in your life right now. But I know that you can be an overcomer. As soon as you leave this building, when that comes, when that attack comes, you can rest assured and know that Jesus Christ is with you. He's with you in the blazing furnace. He'll see you through the furnace and through the hardship. Amen? I got a question, though. Are you a spiritual warrior? Can you fight this war? Can you fight this battle? Do you have what it takes to be a warrior? So I believe inherently all men want to be a fighter. We want to be warriors. But we have doubt. We doubt that we, can, that we have what it takes to be a spiritual warrior. Do you think you're too weak? Too weak to be a warrior. Well, when you're weak, he's strong. Are you not smart enough to be a spiritual warrior? Well, God's, God's wisdom baffles the wise. <laughs> Do you not fit the Christian mold? Do you not look like a spiritual warrior? Well, 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells me that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He doesn't look at your, your tattoos, your sleeves, your piercings, your hair. He doesn't look at that stuff. He doesn't look at what you wear. God does not care about that. All he cares about is the heart. That's what God's looking at. Do you have a heart of a spiritual warrior? Do you have a heart of willingness to pay a price for him? Do you have a, a heart of obedience to be obedient to him so that he can walk right by your side and do the things you can't do? Do you have that today? That's a question. Now, I wish I could tell you today that serving Jesus was easy. I wish I could tell you that, but it's not. It's hard. It's very hard. You know, you're not going to have the, the peaches and cream walk you may like to have. And most of Christianity, most of the religious leaders try to paint this picture of a perfect life when you come to Jesus. I'll be honest with you, I think my life might have been easier before I came to Jesus. But it was a lot more useless and meaningless. It was pointless. 
I was wasting my life. As easy it may have been, I was wasting my life. Now it's hard, but it's hard for a good reason. It's hard for a good purpose. I have reason for living. That's what we all want. We, we want purpose as men. You know, serving Jesus isn't hard because of Jesus. Jesus is not hard. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. You know why serving Jesus is so hard? Because it's flesh and evil. That's what makes it hard. Take for, for just a second, imagine. You can close your eyes if you want. Imagine this. Imagine no flesh. No flesh fighting against us. No flesh fighting against God's ways. Imagine there's no evil fighting against good. Where are you at? You're in heaven. <laughs> that's where you're at. That's what heaven is. When there's no flesh and no evil, that's heaven. You know, our job actually as men of God is to make earth more heaven-like. It's not so much going to heaven. It's bringing heaven to earth, making earth a place God can dwell. See, when we start being Christ-like in all of our ways, in the good times and in the bad, when we're Christ-like and we make earth a more heaven-like place, when we remove the flesh and remove the evil, God can dwell here with us. And that's what it's all about, is making earth more heaven-like. Let's read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Paul again is... Speaking to Timothy here, says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose. Get that. My way of life. It's, it's Paul's way of life. It's not just something he does. It's who he is. My purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> Does that sound good? <laughs> You're going to be persecuted. You're going to go through hardship. But Paul said it even better than that. He said, rejoice in your persecutions. Because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. You know, that's good things coming out of an apparently bad thing. We, all, we try to avoid suffering, but Paul says good comes from suffering. You know, I train for a world title fight. I don't sit on the sofa, eat potato chips, and drink Coke, and then step in the ring to fight a world title fight. That's not the way it happens. I put my body through brutal abuse week after week, 10 to 12 weeks, 40 to 50 hours a week for one little fight that might not last a minute. I do that because I know good will come from my suffering. I know I will be prepared for the fight when the fight comes. So you have to go, be willing to go through suffering to be ready for the fight at hand. Amen. How hard is it to do these things? We read, we read right here. Faith, patience, love, endurance. How hard is it to do that? How hard is it to be faithful to God? How hard is it to put nothing before God? Don't put your checkbook before God. Don't put your, your job before God. Don't put your wife before God, your kids. How hard is it to put nothing before God? How hard is it to... To be faithful to him in every way. Christ Jesus was faithful to us. He deserves faithfulness back. Imagine, imagine if when you were married, your wife said, yes, I promise to be faithful you know, until I don't want to be or until it becomes hard to be faithful to you and I want to be with another man and you know, I'll, I'll be with you forever until I just want to be with somebody else. You would have said, no way. I'm not going to marry this woman. She's not faithful. And Christ Jesus is saying the same thing to us. Will we be faithful to him? When you're flipping through the channels and you see something on the TV that you know is not Christ-like, it's not going to promote godliness in your life. It might be permissible, but it might not, might not be good for your walk with God. Are you going to be faithful to him and say, you know, I don't need that? 
Or when you're walking through and you see a, a, a magazine stand and you see a, a Maxim or a Stuff magazine that you know the only thing in there is death. You're not going to pick up a Maxim and come to an article that promotes godliness. You're not going to do it. Are you willing to be faithful to him and say, you know, I don't need to look at it. And you guys, I'm the first to admit it's hard. I'm the first to admit Satan tries to deceive us every time into saying, you know, it's okay just to take a peek. It's okay just to take a bite of that apple. How hard is it to be patient? How hard is it to be patient with your wife when she does things that drives you crazy? When she, you know, <laughs> maybe I should do it. They're filming this. I'm not going to go on. <laughs> When your wife does things that bothers you, your kids, when they drive you through the wall, how hard is it to be patient with them? How hard is it to love? Let me ask you this. How hard is it to love these guys, everybody here? It's probably pretty easy, really. But how hard is it to love the unlovable? Somebody that doesn't look like you or smell like you or act like you or believe the same things? Or How hard is it to love somebody that hates you? That's hard. But that is what love is. Love is when you love somebody and nothing will be gained in return. That's love. How hard is it to endure? Come on, think about it. When it gets difficult, when nothing in your life is going how you want it, and you wonder if God is still there, if God even cares about you, if he listens to you, if God even exists, how hard is it to keep fighting for his kingdom in the midst of that? Well, that's what we're called to. That's what we're called to today, you guys. February 23rd, 2004, my daughter Abby was born. Little sweet Abby. <laughs> she was born, and, and I took about the next two months out from training or boxing and just helped my wife around the house most of the time. <laughs> helped her out with Abby and did, did those kind of things and got completely out of shape. But one day my dad, you know, I had a dream one night. God spoke to him, said, said, Greg, go back to the enemy's camp. Go to the enemy's camp and take back what was stolen. And the next day, day he came to me and said, Ebo, what does that mean? I said, you know, I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> but I said, uh, you know, God, God will show us. That day we got a call from Lou Duva. You know, you guys know who Lou Duva is? One of the biggest boxing managers and promoters. He called our house, and I have no idea how Lou Duva got our home number, but he called us and he said, guys, we want you to come fight my golden boy, Oscar Diaz, undefeated, 17-0, welterweight, Oscar Diaz, we want you to come to our, our show in Miami and fight him. We want you to come to our camp and take back what the enemy stole. God revealed to us what, what that dream was all about, and my dad came to me and said, Ebo, do, do you want to do it? You got to move up two weight divisions. You got to fight him in 19 days. You're going to be totally out of shape, overweight, unprepared, rusty. Do you want to do it? I said, yeah, there's, there's only one reason why I want to do it. Because I know I can't win this fight. There's no way in the natural I can win this fight. But I know that if I can't win, God will do it for me. Because if I can't do it, he'll get the glory for it. Amen. So we go, I remember pulling in the, the casino in Miami. We come in there, and the ESPN producers, the first thing out of their mouth to me is, are you guys crazy? What are you doing? Are you idiots? And it looked from the outside like we were completely crazy. And maybe we are, I don't know. But <laughs> I moved up two weight divisions, fighting a much bigger guy with 19 days notice. And... Uh, and I said, hey, I said, you know what? Come ask me after the fight. In this fight, God spoke to me. He revealed something to me. This is one of many fights God spoke to me in. And in this fight, first round, I go out. And this, was, this fight was all about God. I spent most of the, uh, the time before the fight preparing spiritually. We anointed every door in the arena with oil, prayed over the place, prayed over the boxing ring. It was a God thing. So we go in, and I fight in the first round. First round was a piece of cake. I was like, man, this is awesome. I'm walking out of the corner. I said, God, I said, you're just going to give it to me. Yeah. 
So, so we go through the break and we come back for the second round. And I'll be honest with you, I almost got knocked out in the second round. It was a rough round. And on the way back to the, after the second round, on the way back to the corner, God spoke to me. He said, Evo, I'm not going to give you anything. You're going to have to do your part. You're going to have to work your butt off all 10 rounds of this fight to get this fight. I'm not going to do what you can do, but I'm going to do everything you can't do. That's good news. <laughs> so in that fight, I learned something. I learned that we have to do our part. We have to do our part as men of God. We have to do what is required of us. You know, I see this as about 10%. It's just like the tithing principle. We do 10, God does 90. Well, it works this way. We have about 10% to do it. And it's really a good thing that 10% of the battle is ours because that's about all we can do. I don't even know if we can, if we can do 10. Most of us try to get by in 1% or 2. But God's saying today, do 10%. And I asked God, I said, God, what is our 10%? What is it that we as men have to do to fight the good fight? He revealed a couple things to me. I think first, we have to clean up our camp. That was one of the things. When I came back after three years out of the sport and God called me back to boxing, he said, you're going to have to clean up your camp. You're going to have to get everything in your camp in alignment with me, in alignment with my word, in obedience to me. You got to clean up camp. You guys, you're going to have to take the things that are in your life that are holding you back, that are keeping you from going full head steam into the kingdom. The things that are holding you back, you got to get them out. You got to remove those things today. You have to clean up camp. The second thing he said is you got to start spiritual training. You got to do what it takes to be trained and prepared. Now, spiritual training it's real simple. You got to read my word. You got to study my word. You got to take it in. You got to make it part of who you are. You got to meditate on it. And you got to pray to me. You got to come to me. Spend time with me daily. Pray and listen to me speak back. Anybody here seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? <laughs> kind of a guy movie, I guess. Well, you know the part of the movie where the two main characters are in Dante's Inferno, and the guy, the dete or the uh, the bad guy, sitting there, and they're eating hamburgers, and they stick a pepper in his hamburger, and he eats it, and he's got an ulcer, and it's killing him. He falls on the floor, and he's he's dying. He's like, "Get the pills, get the pills!" And anyway, they end up giving him rat poison instead of the pills he wanted. But the point of this is that Jim Carrey's on top of him, holding his legs, going in with the good, out with the bad, in with the good, out with the bad. <laughs> yeah. I recall not, long, not too many years back, I, I really wanted to get my life right with God. I wanted to do it, and I, I went to my dad, and I said, I said, Dad, I said, I just got so many things in my life I got to get out. I got to clean up camp, in a sense. And he said, you know, he said, he said, don't even try to get rid of those things. Don't even, don't do that. He said, people do not change, but God changes people. He said, you're not going to be able to change yourself. The things that are in your life, the things in your camp that are dirtying up your life and putting space between you and God, you're not going to be able to do it. I'll go ahead and admit that to you. You cannot do it. But you know what can do it? If you start bringing in the light, it pushes away the darkness. So I began at that moment because I had tried many times to quit drinking. And you know, I admit, at that time, I'd smoke some weed every now and then and I tried to quit that, but I couldn't. I would get around a tempting environment, and I had no foundation on the rock. My foundation was in the sand. The storm would come, and it would wipe me out, and I would give in. But that, I took that time. I took my dad's advice. I said, okay, I'm going to start reading the Word. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start spiritually training. I'm going to see what happens. And I noticed as I brought in the good, as I brought in the light, as I brought in God's word, as I prayed to him, as I, as I fasted, as I listened to him speak, all that bad stuff didn't appeal to me anymore. All that evil, all the darkness, it fled. It fled as fast as it could. The more word I brought in, the more the desire to do the drugs and the drink and the, to do the things with girls, I didn't, the more that desire left. The more I didn't even want to listen to the same music or watch the same TV programs. So don't, don't sit here and go, oh, man, I got so many things I got to do. 
I got to get out of my life. Don't, don't have that bondage. All, all Jesus is about is freedom. And the way he provides freedom is by bringing in the light. You bring in that light, the darkness will flee. Amen. So you got to clean up camp and you got to start your spiritual training. Look, I got a, I got a challenge for you guys today. I want you to take this challenge. I like challenges. I'm a, I'm a type of person that wants a challenge, something to rise to the occasion. Well, here's a challenge, and I promise you it's going to be hard. Everybody seen the, the Bowflex commercials? You seen those? All right. All right. Well, I like what they do. See, they make you believe that if you get buy this $2,000 Bowflex, put it in the corner of your bedroom, and Use it 20 minutes a day, three days a week. You're going to look like this supermodel. That's what they make you believe, okay? Well, it doesn't work that way because here's what happens. Most people buy that $2,000 Bowflex, stick it in the corner of their room, and you know, it's really a pretty good-looking piece of equipment, and they look at it and look at it and look at it. And, they, you know, if on a good day, they might, you know, have some energy. They might have just had a donut and got some carbohydrates in them. <laughs> so they, they're walking by the Bowflex, and they lay down on it and do a rep or two. But nothing happens. Nothing happens. That's the way we generally take our walk with God. That's the way we do it. We go to church on Sunday mornings. We might pray before we eat dinner once or twice a week. The other times we're just getting fast food at, what's, what is it, Crystal? No, it's not Crystal out here. It's uh, In-N-Out Burger or what a burger. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about those places. I don't eat there, man. Anyway, so, so that's what we try to do. We try to, you know, talk to God and read his word a little bit a week. You know, we expect it to be a life-changing thing. Most of the time it ends Sunday afternoon until the next Sunday morning, and that's it. And we expect it to be this profound, life-changing experience, something that seeps through every day of our life, and we expect God to bless us and have favor on us and all these good things to happen. Lord, I went to church Sunday. Why didn't I win the lottery? <laughs> Where's my BMW M3? I, only got, I need a 5,000-square-foot house. I need a 10,000-square-foot house, God. I got three kids. Where are they going to play? That's, like, that's the way we try to do it. But, hey, I got a challenge. When you leave here today, set your sights on this. 30 minutes a day is the starting place. Start 30 minutes a day reading God's Word 15 and praying to Him 15. In the quiet of your bedroom when nobody knows about it. Close the door. Nobody's home. Go walk in the woods and go to a quiet place and do it 30 minutes a day. If you say, I don't have time, well, that's putting something else before God. I promise you this. If you don't have time, if your business doesn't give you time to spend 30 minutes a day with God, do it, and God will make your business more profitable. He will make your business work faster and work more efficiently so you've got an extra 30 minutes a day. I believe he'll move it to an extra hour, maybe even an extra two. Maybe even you won't even need that business anymore, and you can devote your whole life to God, every minute of it. Who knows? But start with 30 minutes a day. That is my challenge for you today. That's my challenge. Now, what do you do, you guys? What do you do after you clean up your camp and after you train for the battle? What do you do? You got to fight. Roll the clip. by any means, but both guys have taken a lot of shots there. Nick, I think you could say it's been a full flex more. I really do. It's been brutal. Oh, low blow by Burton. Not caught by the referee there. Elder with a left. Another left. Crowd standing up. A lot of people here. It's a sellout crowd in Santa Ynez. Final round. Watch your head. Come on, come on. When I say stop boxing, I say stop boxing. See, you know, you can't fight out of control. You can't get desperate for three round, three minutes of this round, even though it's the last one. I don't think either guy has it totally in him, although, because it's hard to know who's the fresher fighter. And now it's Elder backing up, backing off, and I don't know what he's doing with his head down like that. He got flipped before that way, and now he's getting hit also. Elder is tired. But he's punching. 
pushing back certainly enough to prevent the referee from calling a stop. Right. Now it's Elder with a second head of steam. He's got Courtney Burton's attention here. Burton rattled by combinations to the head, so he's been clipped plenty in this final round. Blood streaming from the right eye of Elder, and he gets whacked there again by Burton, who digs to the body with a right and goes southpaw. And goes orthodox. Trying to find those openings. He certainly has found the cracks in the openings in this, and he's been hit himself a lot. Halfway through this final round. I'll tell you what, Nick, set, round seven, eight, and nine, I thought Burton was slowing down. He really came on. I thought he took the last two, and it's a good thing that the way he is. Oh, Elder with a left hand, and Burton is in big trouble, holding on for his life here. Steve, he's not going to make it. There goes the left. Ebo Elder. feet it looks like Steve out on his feet he barely lifted his legs when the referee asked him if you got to stop it there's the left and that's enough he hit him on the way down there an unbelievable stunning turn of events reversal of fortune by Evo Elder Steve I had behind him thank you Lord hey baby you knocked him out you had to have it you did it Courtney Burton is flat on his back. Blood streaming from the right eye as we look in and listen. It's a frightening moment now. also be praying for his opponent because this is the kind of fight where a guy who struggled to make weight can be badly hurt. Bert Burton's effort was amazing. Thank God he had 24 hours to rehydrate himself. As a result, he gave an unbelievable effort, but he was a badly hurt fighter there in the 12th. Yeah, right, and Steve, uh, moments before, we were talking about how he seemed to catch that second win in the 10th and the 11th and was coming on here in the 12th so big until it suddenly changed. That left hand by Ebo Elder again and again and again. Wow, what a finish. And I have to tell you, go and we'll look at the scorecards through 11. Two judges had Elder ahead, well, one by two points, one by four points, and one judge had it dead even. So Elder was headed for victory on the cards. Lord, I thank you for this gladiator, this man with such heart, such skill, such determination. I pray that you make this this loss for him a benefit like you did for me three and a half years ago, God. Make it the best thing that ever happened to him so that he'll turn his life completely to you guys. And you understand, nothing in the natural is worth anything. Only a relationship with you, the Father, the God of the earth. That's all that matters, Lord. I pray that you touch his heart, make him have no pain, no hurt, no misunderstanding. And let him know that I love him as a brother in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Great fight, man. You bad dude. You bad dude, man. You bad. Everybody, everybody, there's a plan Jesus Christ has for your life. Yeah. Just accept it. All right, thank you. Give God. It to it. Chilling God. moment, Ebo Elder barely. Can All right, see now that was not TBN. <laughs> that was Showtime. That was live on Showtime, replayed six times all around the world. So I believe that somewhere in the world, there are, there are men and women flipping through the channels looking for something that, got, that Satan was going to use to deceive them. But they came to that channel, and God 
use Satan's network. Amen. You guys, you could see the emotion on my face. You could see that I was blown away after that fight. Let me tell you why. God gave me a message in that fight. He told me a message. In the second round of the fight, I remember like it was yesterday, I was in a difficult position. I was in a valley. I was in a hard place. And that's where I hear from God. If you're in a difficult position today, look at it as an opportunity to hear from God. So in the second round, in my difficult position, I began to talk to God. And I said to God, you brought me to this fight tonight, Lord. You brought me here to this place. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. And I'm going to want to quit. And he said right back to me, he said, Ebo, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. Immediately, I was filled with joy. I was filled with joy because I knew at that moment... I was going to win the fight by knockout. And I knew that because God doesn't do small things. He doesn't win close decisions. God wins by knockout every time. Amen? Now the natural Ebo started saying, okay, God, good enough. Let this be the last shot. Come on, Jeff. Maybe this little jab. Let that end it. Come on, Lord. Come on. <laughs> round after round after round. Lord, is this a joke? Are you playing with me? I had a broke jaw in the fourth round. Both eyes swollen shut by the eighth. My kidneys were bleeding. I peed blood for three days after that fight. Okay? Now the natural Ebo wanted it to end quickly, but it didn't. In the twelfth round that you just saw, I went to throw a left hand, and I got caught behind the ropes. And when I threw the left hand, all my energy was just drained, and I kind of kind of just went down like this for a second thinking. <laughs> just, just thinking, man. I, you know, I admitted to God at that second, and I knew it without a shadow of a doubt. I said, God, there's no way. I know when I get up, I'm going to get knocked out. There's no way I can win this fight. No way. I knew it. I knew it was over. I said, but God, I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I didn't even think about quitting one time. I said, God, you said you would do what I can't do if I didn't quit. I didn't quit. So I stood up, and when I stood up, I had the same energy I had in the first round of the fight. Every shot landed with precision and power, and I knocked the number four ranked fighter in the world out 30 seconds later. And I was blown away because I got a glimpse of who God is. I got a glimpse of how faithful Jesus is, that he's not a, a God confined within the spiritual box that we like to put him in. He's a God that reached out to a little white kid who grew up on a gravel road, reached out and helped him win a fight in a Chumash casino in San Inez, California, on Showtime. That's the God I serve, a faithful God. And I was blown away. The Bible tells me a story of a lady that had, had bleeding issues, and she knew if she touched the robe of Jesus... She would be healed. Well, that night, I got a fistful of robe. I grabbed that robe. I held on to the robe. I got a glimpse of who Jesus is. Now, listen, the message he told me is for you guys. It's for you this morning, fighting the good fight. This is the message. In this good fight, it's going to get difficult. It's going to get hard. You're going to have the opportunity at any moment. You're going to have the free will choice to throw in a towel during any round. But if you don't quit, if you don't get off my path, I'll do what you can't do. If you stay obedient to me so I can walk right with you, so that I can be right by your side, when you come up against something that's too big for you to control, that's out of your grasp, I will do what you can't do. Amen? That's inspiring. Because there's a lot of things we can't do. Men, I like, you, I, I, I like to believe I can do anything. But I know I can't. We are very limited as human beings. This fight, this fight is incapable of being won by humans. It takes God. We can't win the battle alone. We cannot win the spiritual battle without God. We might try to do it. You might do really good for a week. Your thought life might be real clean. You might not lust over any women. You might not watch a television show you shouldn't watch. And you start getting a big head, right? 
thinking, I, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm bad. Next thing you know, bam, Satan comes in and hits you, and you fall. Hey, but you know what? I'm not going to condemn you for falling. You know why? Because the Bible tells me in Proverbs 24, 16, that although a righteous man falls seven times, he still gets up. You guys got to know that when you fall and when you fail, you can get up. You can get up. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. But our fight should be that we stay on that path. We stay obedient to God so that when it gets too difficult, when we come against something, we come against a disease, we have a, a broken marriage, we have a, a daughter or a son that's fallen away, fallen into the world, and we have no control over it, that if we stayed obedient to him, God will do what we can't do. Amen? That's good news. That's how to fight the good fight. That's what the good fight is. Staying obedient to God. 10, 11, 12 rounds. Don't quit. 